Well, good morning and welcome to Grace Church. Uh, I'm thrilled that you're able to worship with us this morning, so let's sing together. Your light shines through all darkness, my darkness, like a fire. It consumes all my fears and my failures. Your grace overwhelms like a flood straight from heaven. Your hope opens eyes to the floodgates of heaven. Jesus, King of all the earth, let the heavens proclaim your worth. The one true God defeated the grave. We join with angels to sing your praise. Overthrown is the power of darkness. All darkness lost its hold when you came with your kindness and your goodness your love breaks the chains of my heart of my mind and your power sets free all the captives and you bring peace jesus king of all the earth let the heavens declare your worth the one true god defeated the grave we join with angels to sing your praise jesus king of all the earth let the heavens proclaim your worth the one true god defeated the grave we join with angels to sing your praise Sing together, all oh, my soul will sing. And all oh, my soul will sing. Oh, my soul will praise you, Jesus, King of all the earth. Let the heavens proclaim your worth. The one true God defeated the grave. We join with angels and sing your praise. Jesus, King of all the earth, let the heavens proclaim your worth. The one true God defeated the grave. We join with angels and sing your praise. Psalm 27 verses 13 and 14 say, I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. These verses have helped sustain me during difficult times in my life. Times when I found myself waiting. Waiting is hard. I am not a very patient person and I don't like waiting in the best of times, let alone through difficult times. And it's especially hard to wait when we have no idea how long the wait will be. So what does it mean to wait for the Lord? Here is what uh, Pastor Tim Keller has to say about that. Waiting on God, then, is to be busy in service to God and to others, all in full acceptance of his wisdom and timing. That kind of waiting may indeed be long and excruciating. But finally, it leads to a new song of praise to God. Right now, we're in a period of waiting, and we don't know for how long. We do, however, have promises from God. We know the ways that he's come through for his people throughout history. We've seen his goodness in our own lives, and we believe that we will continue to see it. While we wait, we can serve him and others through words of encouragement, and we can glorify him through songs of praise. Pray with me, and then let's continue singing together. Heavenly Father, we lift our hearts and our voices up to you. Draw near to us in our waiting. Be glorified in our waiting. 
And may our waiting and our singing be an act of worship to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Just a moment, we're going to sing this song together. It's called All Hail King Jesus. And this is a song that I selected for our church for Easter. It's a song that talks about how uh, Jesus really is the king, that he conquered uh, death and the grave and that he paid the price for our sins. So hopefully as we sing this song, you're going to learn it. You're going to be able to sing along. So I want to invite you to do that right now. Let's sing together. There was a moment when the lights went out When death has claimed its victory The king of love had given up his life The darkest day in history There on a cross they made for sinners For every curse his blood atoned One final breath and it was finished But not the end we could have known For the earth began to shake the veil was torn the sacrifice was made as the heavens rolled oh hell king Jesus in of light breaking through When all was lost he crossed eternity The king of life was on the move For in a dark cold tomb Where our Lord was laid One miraculous breath forever changed Oh, hell, King Jesus Oh, hell, the Savior of the world Oh, hell, King
You are truly the savior of the world. There's no other way that we can have life in this life apart from you. Lord, thank you that you went to the cross, that you paid the price for our sins. Lord, that you became a curse. And Lord, I thank you so much that in you, we have eternal life. We have life forever. Lord, thank you for your love for us poured out on the cross. We ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning. Why don't you grab your Bibles, and we're going to look at the passage that Tom will be preaching on today. It's in the book of Nehemiah. We'll be reading chapter 12, verses 27 through 43. That passage is titled, The Dedication of the Wall. And again, we're in Nehemiah, chapter 12, verses 27 through 43. And at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought the Levites in all their places, to bring them to Jerusalem, to celebrate the dedication with gladness, with thanksgivings and with singing, with cymbals, harps, and lyres. And the sons of the singers gathered together from the districts surrounding Jerusalem and from the villages of the Netophathites, also from Beth Gilgal and from the region of Geba and Asmaveth. For the singers had built for themselves villages around Jerusalem. And the priests and the Levites purified themselves, and they purified the people and the gates and the wall. Then I brought the leaders of Judah up onto the wall and appointed two great choirs that gave thanks. One went to the south on the wall to the dung gate, and after them went Hoshiah and half of the leaders of Judah, and Azariah, Ezra, Meshulam, Judah, Benjamin, Shemaiah, and Jeremiah, and certain of the priest's sons with trumpets, Zechariah, the son of Jonathan, son of Shemaiah, son of Mattaniah, son of Micaiah, son of Zechor, son of Asaph, and his relatives, Shemaiah, Azarel, Melali, Gilali, Maai, Nathanel, Judah, and Hanani, with the musical instruments of David, the man of God. And Ezra the scribe went before them. At the fountain gate, they went up straight before them by the stairs of the city of David, at the ascent of the wall, above the house of David, to the water gate on the east. The other choir of those who gave thanks went to the north, and I followed them with half of the people on the wall, above the tower of the ovens, to the broad wall, and above the gates of Ephraim, and by the gate of Yeshana, and by the fish gate, and the tower of Hananel, and the tower of the hundred, to the sheep gate. And they came to a halt at the gate of the guard. So both choirs of those who gave thanks stood in the house of God, and I and half of the officials with me, and the priests, Eliakim, Maaseah, Maniamin, Micaiah, Elio and I, Zechariah, Hananiah, with trumpets, and Maaseah, Shemaiah, Eliezer, Uzi, Jehohana, Malkijah, Elam, and Ezer. And the singers sang with Jezriah as their leader. And they offered great sacrifices that day and rejoiced, for God had made them rejoice with great joy. The women and children also rejoiced, and the joy of Jerusalem was heard far away. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you for your greatness and your power and your majesty and your love and your mercy and your grace. And we come before you as your people this morning, eager to be taught. Would you open the eyes of our heart Would you uh, sharpen our ears and our minds, Father, as we are in our separate homes? We pray that you would knit us together and unite our hearts to be your one body of, of believers. We pray, Father, for this teaching to penetrate deep into our hearts and uh, for us to be attentive to it. 
We, Father, we ask that you would help us to rejoice as uh, the people did in their great God. And we, we thank you for who you are. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, we're in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic and everything is shut down. And so I've thought over the last week uh, as to what I should preach about. Last week, Paul chose to change our preaching calendar and not continue in Nehemiah. And I wondered if I should do the same. Uh, but as I thought and prayed about it, I decided, no, I, I think I'll just continue on with our preaching series and moving towards the completion of uh, the topics in the book of Nehemiah that we've been looking at. In the midst of all the uncertainty that we're all experiencing, I felt like it would be helpful to us to have something that remains the same. So this morning, I would like to speak on the passage that was just read to us. We've come to the point in the book, towards the end of the book now, where the people dedicate the walls of the city of Jerusalem. And if you followed along for some time, you might feel like this has been a long time in coming. The need to rebuild the walls was the subject of the very first passage in the book in Nehemiah chapter 1, when Nehemiah, far away in Babylon, first heard that the walls of his ancestral city were destroyed and that the city was an unprotected place with just a few scattered residents living there in fear and in great need. And so the story unfolds of Nehemiah's journey to the city, his secret inspection of the walls at night, his gathering of the leaders and request of them to engage in the rebuilding of the walls, and then the opposition by the political powers from provinces and kings around them, and uh, the intimidation and threats that they experienced as they attempted to build the walls. But despite it all, the people persisted under Nehemiah's leadership, and the walls were rebuilt at the end of chapter 6. You would expect then to move on to the celebration and dedication of the walls of Jerusalem, that now again the city had become a protected city, a fortified city, able to care for itself. But we read there for three chapters that Nehemiah, the governor, and Ezra, the priest, worked together to engage the nation in covenant renewal, where they brought their hearts before the Lord and they sought to bring their hearts in line with the kind of dedication that God's covenant with them and with their forefathers that was made a thousand years before that that covenant required of them in his word. And so now, finally, as we're almost done with the book, we come to the dedication of the walls. Now, as I've read this passage over the last few uh, months and weeks as I've been preparing for this, there's one thing that kept coming to my mind, and it's uh, an important point in our future as a church that's going to happen this fall when I complete my ministry as the lead pastor of this church and Paul is appointed to take over and move the church forward. And I realize you could read this passage and, and never think about that, but you understand that that's on my mind every day, especially this year. And as I said many months ago, when I felt that God was calling me to step down, not from ministry in general, but from the kind of leadership and the position that I've had as the lead pastor of this church over the last 36 years, that the most important thing I could do in the remaining year or so of my ministry was to help our church make a good and effective transition to a new lead pastor. And I, I felt that at the time, and I still feel that now. And so much of my time and energy is spent thinking about and working towards that, even though for most of you, the transition is, is behind the scenes. All that I'm trying to do is to contribute to the work that God is doing here. And as I read this passage, I realized that there are some remarkable parallels between what they were experiencing at that time uh, and what we are experiencing now. Now, of course, the differences are huge, uh, but there are some interesting parallels. First, uh, in this passage, we're reading about the end of one era, so to speak, and the beginning of another. And while the situation is completely different, that much is the same 
And then, of course, we're reading of the public recognition and indeed the celebration of that fact that one era is ending and a new era is beginning. And finally, what we're reading for these people is the commencement of a new administration. I mean, what has happened in the Old Testament is that Israel was made the people of God, given the promised land, built a temple in the holy city of Jerusalem and flourished for nearly a thousand years. And then they were cast into exile. The land was taken away from them. The temple was destroyed and they became a non-people. But God brought them back, small in number, brought them back to Palestine, to Judea, to Jerusalem, the city, and to rebuild the temple and rebuild the walls. And we have a beginning, a re-beginning, you might say, of the people of God again in their own city, in their own temple. So while there's nothing in the passage that tells us what we ought to do in our time of transition, there are a number of things that I think we can draw out of this to help us consider how we should seek to worship God and to follow God and celebrate our own transition. So I see four important elements here I'd like to think about for just a few minutes. They are advance, planning, and preparation, music and singing, meaningful formality, and supreme joy. And those four things I'd like to show you in this passage. The first thing we read about at the very beginning of the passage is we read about their advanced planning and their preparation for this, a great, this great event that's going to occur. So if you have a Bible, turn to what was read, Nehemiah chapter uh, 12 and verse 27, and we'll read there. We read, at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought the Levites in all their places to bring them to Jerusalem to celebrate the dedication with gladness, with thanksgivings, and with the singing, with singing, with cymbals, harps, and lyres. And the sons of the singers gathered themselves together from the districts surrounding Jerusalem and from the villages of the Netophathites, also from Beth Gilgal and from the region of Geba and Asmaveth, for the singers had built for themselves villages around Jerusalem, and the priests and the Levites purified themselves, and they purified the people and the gates and the wall. Now, obviously, many things in life require advanced planning, and some of those things we get used to. I, here I am preaching on a, on a Sunday morning, and, and I remember the first time, the first service that we had, it wasn't in this building, it was in a smaller building, September 9th, 1984. And I remember how much went into the preparation for that service. I had never been a pastor before. And while I'd preached a few times, I, I'd never had to prepare a service, like put together all the elements of a service. And I remember that day very distinctly going home in the afternoon, having dinner with a group of people and rejoicing in what God had done and then sitting down and thinking to myself, and I've got to do this all over again next week. It was a rather daunting uh, thought of having to do this week after week, but like many things in life, you get used to what you do over and over, and it takes advanced preparation. But that's the way life works. My wife and I raised four children. I'm not much of a cook. My wife's a great cook, and she's cooked dinner for 44 years. And um, I always stand amazed at what she can throw together in just a few minutes, it seems, for us to eat. But of course, there's a great deal of difference in a, a mother cooking a dinner for an informal family dinner and, and putting on a celebration like at Easter or Thanksgiving. They take different kinds of preparation. And the same is true for churches. And it was true for the event that Ventus described here. For one thing, it tells us they brought the Levites in early, who were apparently living in their towns and villages outside of the city of Jerusalem, in the province that was called Judah. And uh, they were going to have to come and prepare the music and all of the other things that were going to go on on that day. So they gathered in the singers who were going to sing to the music that the Levites themselves were going to offer 
and that had to be prepared. And then it says at the end that uh, not only that, but they purified themselves, the priests and Levites, and the people on the walls. And we don't really know what that involved. It was certainly a ritual activity, but it would also involve, you might just think of cleaning the city and the walls for this great event in which people were gonna come from all around the region and they were gonna come in and celebrate in the holy city. And we have to note this event was not just for those who lived in Jerusalem and who experienced the protection of the walls. The event was regional in its significance. And uh, so many others were going to be brought in and they had to prepare carefully for what was going to happen on that day. And I want you to think of what we're doing in the same way. The event that we're going to celebrate in the fall when Paul is installed as the lead pastor is not simply something that benefits us as a church. In a very real sense, it, it benefits the people of God in whatever churches and communities they are in around us. And so we're inviting the pastors of the churches that we've planted in the past to come and be a part of the service in which Paul is installed in office on September 13. And so obviously, I'm simply describing something that, that requires advanced planning and preparation to happen. And then we note a second thing in this passage, and that's already been mentioned, but it receives prominence throughout the passage, and that's music and singing. Throughout the passage, this whole idea is woven through that not only did they prepare for it, but, but the actual event involved from beginning to end, music and singing. Uh, the Levites bring in the singers, and then what happens is at the direction of Nehemiah and uh, Ezra, they form two great choirs that are involved with a group of people, two great groups of people made up of both priests and lay people who are going to start at some point on top of the wall, which would have been 12 to 14 feet wide. This is a fortified city. This is not something that can be torn down easily. And those groups are going to walk around the city in opposite direction with music and singing going on. And while we don't know where they started, so it's hard to know the directions that they took, they both seem to have ended up in the passage in the northeast side of the city where the temple was and then engaged in worship together in the temple. Now, music and singing is a part of this from beginning to end. And uh, today, sometimes we call uh, music worship. And I've often pointed out that's technically not correct. Music by itself is not worship, at least in scripture it's not. Music is a part of worship. Uh, worship in a, in a formal sense, like when people meet together and they engage in activities in the worship of God, it involves a number of things that go on for a group of people now, there's been a great debate in history that you've probably never heard of, is the debate about how worship meetings are put together. This has been gone on for a thousand years. There's a difference between what is called the regulative principle in worship and one that's called the normative principle. We don't need to go into detail about all of that. Let me just say that I hold uh, to the, what's usually called the regulative principle in worship, and that is that God himself indicates for us in the Bible those things he desires to be done when we worship him. We are not allowed to come into God's presence and make up what we think we ought to do in order for God to be pleased with us. God tells us clearly what activities he expects us to engage in. He, he tells us what he delights in in worship and, and then he commands us to do that in scripture and he gives us as well multiple examples of those things being done throughout scripture that illustrate what worship looks like. And so we can draw from beginning to end of the scriptures, what are the activities of worship that God delights in? I can list them briefly. I'm going to leave out a couple of things that would take more explanation, but generally the, the activities that go on in worship according to the Bible are first of all prayer, that is individual and group prayer. And then secondly, the public reading of the Bible commanded in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 13. And then what that passage calls um, exhortation and teaching 
which is simply the explanation of a passage of the Bible with its application. And then there's also singing together, which is both commanded and illustrated throughout the Bible. There is the confession of faith, which can be done in singing. And uh, there's the celebration of the covenant signs of baptism and the Lord's Supper. Those things comprise really the proper activities of worship in a public sense. And one of them I noted is music and singing. It is one aspect of worship. It's not all that worship is, but I also want to say it's a very important aspect of worship. And the reason is that music, at least in an ideal sense, when it's done well with thought, music involves the combination of truth with the emotional experience of that truth in a way that other things don't necessarily involve. Another is that it, it sometimes involves prayer to God that's put in a musical form. So you, you're praying, but not necessarily experience that you're praying. Or depending on the words of the song, it may involve exhortation of other people in a musical form. And so music encompasses some of the other elements of worship. And that makes it a very important aspect of worship. Now, whenever we meet for worship in small groups or large groups, we should lift our voices in song. Those of you who have been part of groups that I have led in the past and that have helped other people to take over and lead will know that I almost invariably make people sing. And they don't like it a lot of times because they're not used to singing in a group. But I'll hand out sheets that have words of music on it and we'll sing it together. And one of my goals is to help people over time to break down that sense that they have of reluctance, of fear, of lifting their voice to God and to begin to do that together. And I always delight when I experience that and I, and I find someone who maybe was very reluctant and just sat looking at a piece of paper begin to sing out loud when we're in a group. Even when we're watching a video, like today, and Joe leads us in singing, that's what he's doing. He's leading us in singing, and, and we should participate in that. A music leader is not, at least in that case, simply performing music for us to watch. He's leading us drawing us to give our hearts to God, to lift our voices in praise to God together. And that should be an important part of our celebration. In the fall, when we get together and we celebrate this great event of the transition from one leader to another, and the transition from one generation of leadership to another generation of leadership, it's a part of worship that I hope we prepare very carefully this fall. And then there's another aspect that comes through clearly in this passage. It's what I call meaningful formality. What's described is some kind of event in which these two groups of people march all the way around the walls of the city. The leaders carefully prepared these great choirs to accompany these two groups. And um, note that each group was not a choir, each group contained a choir who were assisting them verbally to worship God. Each included apparently Levites, who in, in this passage are presented as instrumentalists, along with singers who are separate from the Levites, who sing together. And uh, each group apparently included both lay people and the clergy, so to speak, the religious leaders of the nation. Nehemiah, we we're told, is in, was in one group. Ezra was in the other group. And, and these two groups started at the same point, as I mentioned, and went around the city. And, and it was more than simply pageantry. You might think of it that way. It was a formal act, but it was more than that. It was a symbolic reconsecration of the very walls that surrounded the city, a recognition of their importance and of the importance of Jerusalem as the city that God himself had appointed to be the place of worship under the Old Covenant. Now, the modern world, the world in which we live, and the modern church seems a bit distant from formality. A lot has happened in the last 50 years or so that has broken down some of the formality that churches used in the past. It's kind of put to death a dead and wooden kind of formality that churches used long after their importance was understood by people. But I want you to understand that 
The word formality is related simply to the word form. It means to put form to something in order to underline its importance. You know, I, I was brought up in a family that was not, I don't think you would say a Christian family in the sense that we didn't think of the Christian faith as an important part of our everyday lives. We rarely talked about it. It wasn't considered important, even though we had some connection to a church. But let me tell you what happened every night of my life as I was growing up. When we sat down at table for the family dinner, uh, we had to wait to eat until my mother sat down, who usually cooked the dinner. When she sat down, we all held hands around the table, and my father, always my father, only my father, prayed. He prayed the same prayer, and he thanked God for the food. And when he was done praying, he got up from the head of the table, he walked around the table to where my mother was seated, and he kissed her on the lips every day of my life. And that was a formality. Now, I can guarantee for you, our family dinner was not formal in any sense. The same things happened in our family that happened in every family. People made jokes. Uh, they did things that were rude. They got sent to their room. I mean, all kinds of things happened at family dinner. But, but the fact is, that one act of formality kind of set apart, in my mind, the structure of the importance of family dinner that I've carried with me for the rest of my life. And what I'm saying is that some forms, some formality, provides a kind of distinctiveness to certain activities of life. And, and we know that there's a certain kind of formality to a graduation, a, a different kind for a wedding, a different kind for a, a funeral. And each one involves certain words, and sometimes a distinctive clothing, some ritual actions that make the event memorable and important to people. And the same applies at very important events of life. That's what's being described in this passage. They did something that was unusual walking around the walls of the city. They did it for a reason, to dedicate the walls of the city, but they did it also because that act of formality was meaningful. It cemented in people's minds the importance of the city and the walls. And the same applies to us. When we make this transition in the fall, the transfer of leadership from one person to another, from one generation to another generation, involves uh, certain formal acts like the laying on of hands by other leaders and prayer for a person. It, it, when that happens, a person is being both identified, you might say publicly, and set aside to fill an office in, in the presence of everyone who's seated there. A certain set of responsibilities in an office he's formally being installed into. The act doesn't confer any kind of power to the person or anything like that, but it does recognize the importance of the responsibilities and the duties that are being assumed. And that's what I mean by meaningful formality. The worship of God should involve at points meaningful formality. So we've got careful planning and preparation, music and singing, meaningful formality, and finally, supreme joy. Th that is really brought out in this passage. In fact, I want you to note the first verse and the last verse underline that. The first verse of the passage, verse 27, and at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought the Levites in all their places to bring them to Jerusalem to celebrate the dedication with gladness, with thanksgivings, and with singing. And then you read the last verse. And they offered great sacrifices that day and rejoiced, for God had made them rejoice with great joy. The women and the children also rejoiced, and the joy of Jerusalem was heard far away. In fact, he uses the words joy or rejoice five times in one sentence. They offered great sacrifices that day and rejoiced, for God had made them rejoice with great joy. Women and children also rejoiced like everyone was there. And the joy of Jerusalem was heard far away. I mean, this is underlined in the passage. I want you to note this passage is meant to offset a previous passage in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, which were originally one book. 
Back in the fall, when we looked uh, early in Nehemiah, Nehemiah the priest came from Babylon down to Jerusalem because the temple wasn't destroyed. The walls were torn down. And the first thing that we were told he did is that he led the people to rebuild the altar of burnt offering in the very place in the midst of the ruins of the temple where it was meant to stand. He rebuilt the altar of built offering and they began that day, before they even rebuilt the rest of the temple, they began that day to offer the daily sacrifices, morning and evening, that were required and prescribed by the law. Those things did not require a temple. They had gone on before the temple. And then they began to build the temple walls around the altar itself until they were done. And at the time that they built the, the altar and they were building the walls, they had a dedication as well. It's recorded in Ezra chapter 3. Let me read what occurred that day because it was similar to what we just read with one great difference. Here's what it says, Ezra 3, beginning in verse 11. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever towards Israel. And all the people shouted with great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and heads of fathers' houses, old men who had seen the foundation of the first house, wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of this house being laid. Though many shouted for joy, so that the people could not distinguish the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping, for the people shouted with a great shout, and the sound was heard far away. Now, what we're reading is a mixed experience of the celebration of worship in which some were weeping, some were shouting in joy, some were looking back the glory of Solomon's temple that had been utterly destroyed and noting that what they were making now would just be a, a small reflection of the glory that once was theirs, which they had lost through their rebellious ways. But now when you come to the end of the story, the temple is functioning. The walls have been rebuilt around the city and it's being established again as the capital city of the people of God under the old covenant. Now, what you see in Nehemiah chapter 12 is that the reader is meant to draw his mind back to what he read earlier. He's meant to note the joy and the sorrow that was mixed is now replaced by pure joy, supreme joy at what God has done what Peter calls in 1 Peter chapter 1, joy inexpressible and full of glory. And there are points in life where joy ought to be experienced and expressed. I know I felt that at points in life, certainly you have too. I felt that in the day I was married. In a different way, I felt it at the weddings of each one of my children. I felt it at the birth of my children. And even a couple of times in life, I've experienced it at the funeral of a choice saint going home to glory. And it's really what we should feel when we see God's hand at work in blessing and power. And that's what I'm praying we'll draw from this passage and experience this fall when we meet together on September 13th and we make that transition from my leadership to Paul's. And I invite you to reflect on this passage and think about what this means, not only for that time and great times, but for every time of public worship that we meet together and worship God. Let's pray. Our gracious God and Father, again, as we bow before you, we thank you that you are the God of grace and mercy, and you are also a God of power. This passage reveals to us a key point in which Israel is restored, not to her former greatness, but to such a small thing, just one tiny nation in the midst of a sea of nations around her. But we know that that was important for what followed in preparation for the coming of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that their celebration is meant to be mirrored and even heightened in our own experience when we worship you in spirit and truth. And we pray that you might help us to both understand what this means and to bring our hearts to you when we are able to gather and to worship you with supreme joy. And we pray this.
with thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing together. stars they wept the morning sun was dead the savior of the world was falling his body on the cross his blood pulled down for us the weight of every curse upon him when final breath he gave as heaven looked away, the Son of God was laid in darkness. The battle in the grave, the war on death was waged, the power of hell forever broken. The ground began to shake, the stone was rolled away. Perfect love could not be overcome. Now, death, where is your sting? Our resurrected King has rendered you defeated. Forever He is glorified. Forever He is lifted. The stone was rolled away. His perfect love could not be overcome. Now, death, where is your sting? Our resurrected King has rendered you defeated. Forever He is glorified. Lifted high forever, he 
evermore for endless days we will see your praise oh lord oh lord our god oh lord oh lord our god good morning grace church thank you so much for joining us uh, to worship together online in this service. We hope that it's been an encouragement for you and that it fills your heart and your mind with truth and with uh, joy. Uh, we're gonna move into a time of giving this morning here at Grace Church. We believe giving is a part of our regular worship. And I just wanna read this passage for us before we give. It's from the book of Proverbs, chapter 11, verse 25. It says this, A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Uh, God doesn't only ask us as believers to give towards others, he actually says that he will refresh us as we give. And that's our hope this morning, that uh, when we go into this time of giving, that God will also refresh your heart as you give towards others. Let's pray over the offering uh, this morning. Uh, Father God, thank you so much for the chance to be together in this way. Uh, we pray that you would um, fill our hearts with great joy and gratitude and that we would give out of hearts uh, that are filled with grace and that we give grace towards other others because of that. Uh, God, would you use these gifts for your purposes, for your kingdom glory, and we trust that you will. Um, and we just pray for our hearts in that process as well. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning again. Uh, here at Grace Church, we have a new, easy, and very secure way that uh, we can give. Uh, it's called Text to Give, and it's very simple. Um, with your mobile device, you can text any amount to 84321. Once again, the number is 84321, um, and you can just text the amount you would like to give. As soon as you do that, it'll respond back to you um, to set up Text to Give. We'll click the link that it sends, and then it asks you to find our church name. Now, as you see here, there's other churches, but we are at the top. You can see our logo there, so we click that church. The great thing about text to give is that once you set it up the first time, you never have to set it up again. Anytime you'd like to give, you can go into your text messages, text any amount to 84321, and now that it's all set up, it will just give flawlessly to the church. Thank you so much for worshiping with us through giving. We really appreciate your generosity and we look forward to partnering with you and sharing the gospel with our community. Well, it's really different to meet together in this way, isn't it? Uh, sitting alone with your family in the living room, uh, watching us on television or on a computer screen, but we should be glad that we have such technology available to us. You know, previous generations would not have had any way to hear the word of God spoken like this. Uh, but despite that, I'm sure this experience leaves you longing for the time when we'll be back together in this auditorium and we'll be singing and praying and reading God's word and listening in the presence of God. But in this service, I wanted to help you look forward from our present time. We don't know how long this situation is going to last, but we we all can look forward to that time in the fall when we trust we will be able to be together again as a church on September 13th. And this is a great time to reflect on that, think about it, and seek to prepare our hearts for it. And while we don't know how long this present lockdown of our society is going to last, one thing is clear, it's gonna last through next Sunday. And uh, so next Sunday, we're going to be meeting again in this way. And what I plan to do next Sunday is to complete our series on Nehemiah. We'll look at the last chapter of Nehemiah, chapter 13. And uh, let me encourage you to read that in advance before we get together next week. But usually you might know it on the first Sunday of every month, we meet together and we celebrate communion in our morning services. And, and let me say that the very nature of communion, what is involved in it, according to scripture, lets us know that it is simply not something that is possible to be done in a virtual sense. Um, the Lord's Supper, as it's called in scripture, is a celebration of a gathered church who are celebrating their unity and their solidarity as a family of God's people. 
It's not an individual act in scripture. It's not even an act of a married couple or of a family when they meet together. It is clearly a church act. It, it's the covenant sign that binds us together as the people of God in a community of worshipers. And that's why the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 17, because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. And what that underlines is that the very symbolism of the Lord's Supper requires a gathered church. There is one table. There are common elements that we come to the table as family members do, and we share in those elements around the table. So next week, while we will not be able to celebrate the Lord's Supper, I want us to use the time uh, thinking about that before to prepare our hearts for that time when we will again have freedom to do that. One thing that this shutdown can do is it can raise for us the sense of how great a thing it is to be able to engage with other people, sitting shoulder to shoulder in the same room, singing together songs of praise to God, praying and being led in prayer, reading the scripture and so forth. And I think we should long for that to come back to us and feel that while we have opportunities to assist our personal walk with God through watching something like we are doing today, there is nothing that can quite replace the activity of public worship together. So let's look forward to that and to that time when we will again break the bread and share the cup together. So please bow in your hearts and your heads in a closing word of blessing. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, thank you so much for participating in this video of our service. We are putting online our services every week at 9.30. You can access it the same way that you did this this morning. We hope that this, uh, along with the devotionals that are coming out throughout the week that you can also access, will be helpful to you to sustain you in your spiritual life while you're not able to go very much outside of your home. We trust that God will continue to care for you and if you have needs, whether it's for food or prayer or whatever your need is, please contact us through the website and we will seek to meet, meet your need as we are able. May God bless and sustain you through this time.